All right, 717, we have two questions for this week. Question number one is, uh, are, sins, are there some sins that are worse than other sins? For instance, uh, is murder really more serious, say, than stealing or something like that? And where this question tends to come from is that there are, uh, there, there are theological statements that you'll hear sometimes like, all sins are equal in the eyes of God. And there is an aspect of which this is true. Uh, it is true that all sins have the same effect of separating us from our Creator, that uh, telling a lie and committing murder both have the same consequence of either temporarily or maybe even permanently separating us from our Creator. So uh, the smallest sin has a way of breaching the relationship with God, just like the biggest sin does. So there is an aspect to which all sins are really equal in the eyes of God when it comes to the effect in our relationship with Him. That being said, that statement that all sins are equal in the eyes of God, uh, that kind of is an extrapolation from things like uh, Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So sin is anything we do that falls short of achieving, demonstrating the glory of God in our lives or demonstrating the glory of God in the world. So any sin can do that. All sin has the same effect of diminishing the glory of God as evidenced in our own life. So there is, a, there is an element of which we can say all sin is equal in the eyes of God. However, it is also clear in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New, that certain sins are more egregious than others when it comes to their impact against one another. So cl clearly, stealing a neighbor's uh, cow is not as serious as killing your neighbor. So, and the way we know this is the civil law in the Old Testament has a punitive damage levels that are different for various crimes. Same in the New Testament. There are things in the New Testament that uh, church members did that Paul would rebuke them for and say, hey, you know, you got to do better than that. Uh, you need to do better at walking with the Lord and you need to do better about the way you use your gifts. But there are also certain sins that would get you dismissed completely from the church, like in 1 Corinthians, where one of the young men in the church uh, starts dating his father's wife. I know it's a creep out factor too, but in addition to that, uh, apparently it's so egregious that even the local pagans, even the local Corinthians who are known for their sexual immorality, got the, got the sense of gross out factor on that. Like, really, seriously, that's okay? So Paul had them discipline or dismiss that person from the church to tell the world, no, 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 we're not putting up with that kind of egregious sin. So even in the New Testament, there was a difference where if you had, uh, if you had lost your temper at another church member, uh, Paul would say, hey, you, you, gotta, you guys need to act nice to each other. You need to treat each other with kindness. You need to ask for forgiveness and restore that. But if you're dating your dad's wife, you're going to get dismissed from the church. So it's clear that there are sins within our relations with one another and within our relationship with God that are viewed as more significant, more damaging, more detrimental to us and others than, than other sins. So the sin of uh, telling a lie is very serious, but clearly not as serious as murdering your neighbor. And so I think there's an element of which all sins are the same because they all have the same ultimate consequence of separating us from God. However, there are degrees of sin within the uh, civil and judicial workings of God within humanity, sins that have greater impact on us. So clearly Adolf Hitler's sins are more serious than the guy who, uh, who committed uh, corporate fraud. Uh, those are not the same level of sin. And even in our society, we have different levels of punishment for different sins. So we follow the divine edict in this regard. So there is an element in which all sins are same. There's also an element in which there is a distinction between some sins being more egregious than others, uh, at least in the temporary sense of this world. All right. Well, and also the next world, too, in terms of eternal judgment. Okay. The second question for today so question number two is, 
uh, has to do with someone who professes to be a believer but doesn't bear any fruit. And is that person really a believer and how do we know? And I think I draw your attention to the parables in Matthew's gospel. I think it's Matthew 13 where Jesus tells the parable of the four soils where the sower is planting seed and the seed is cast broadly, just throwing it all over the place. And some of the seed winds up on the driveway. Some of it winds up in the um, flower bed where there's other things growing. Some of it winds up on some rocky area and some winds up uh, in the place where it's intended to go, which is in the healthy soil. And the effect is that uh, the one on the rocky soil, the bird eats, the one on the, I mean, the one on the path, the bird eats, the one on the rocky soil grows up but has no root and is burned out by the sun. The one in the flower bed is choked out by the other plants. And then the one in the good soil produces a bumper crop. And so uh, Jesus says, uh, basically in that parable, we want to be good soil so that when his word hits us, when the gospel of Jesus Christ about his kingdom comes to us, it produces fruit in us. And so one of the questions asked at the end of that parable is, which of those four soils is actual believers? Clearly, it seems like the last soil is a believer. It's producing fruit. Clearly, it seems like the first soil where the bird snatches it off the path before it even takes root. Clearly, that person's not a believer. What do we do with these other two soils? Uh, and it's interesting to me that the very next parable Jesus tells is the parable of the wheat and the tares, where there is sown within a field both wheat and tares, and we are told we are not the ones to pull out the tares from the wheat, we are to let them both grow and let God sort them out later on. And so I think uh, one of the things I want to caution us against is by saying, okay, the certain amount of fruit is necessary and expected from true believers. I think I would caution us against any of us trying to ferret that out in another person's life. That's always dangerous. We should encourage them to good works. We should encourage every person to evaluate their own life or whether they really know God or not. But we should also not sit around and nitpick other people's lives and say, see there, they're not a believer because, look, they didn't bear this fruit or that fruit. Um, those things are dangerous. However, personal introspection, which I think is the point of those parables, of asking the question, am I really a believer, is a great question. And we should ask that by looking at the fruit in our life. Does my life reflect things like uh, Galatians where Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, those kinds of things are necessary to, for someone to claim to be a believer. Fruit being uh, also uh, uh, the using of their gifts within the church, the kindness expressed to other people, the, the using of their gifts outside the church. Those kinds of things are necessary if they're really a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'd say I would look at my own life and ask the question, am I bearing fruit in my own life? And if I am, what kind of fruit is there? What are my motives behind that fruit? And then I would encourage other people to bear fruit as well, but not analyzing their life to say, well, see, you're not a believer or you are a believer, uh, to just say, look, these are the kinds of things we would expect in my own life and the Bible seems to expect in each other's life. And so the Bible really should be used primarily as an introspection of our own life and then and as an encouragement to other people to imitate Christ in their life as well. All right, we'll see you guys Sunday night.